Good morning. Good morning. Uh, today is a day to remember uh, Christian captives. Uh, in the last year, 4,125 believers were arrested, detained without trial, or imprisoned. And 3,906 believers were abducted for faith-related reasons. Additionally, there are approximately 60,000 believers held in labor camps in North Korea. Uh, these are our brothers and sisters in Christ who are being imprisoned and held captive because they choose to follow Jesus. This morning, we have the opportunity to stand with them and pray for them. Uh, in May, militants aligned with the Allied Democratic Forces, the ADF, kidnapped Pastor Paluku and his wife Esther of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, DRC. Pastor Paluku is the main pastor of the 3E CBCA Church in Lalwa, Mombasa Territory, DRC. Uh, two days before they, were, they went missing, he and his wife had gone to their farm, which is a couple of kilometers away from the village. And as was typical, they intended to spend a night or two at the farm for the harvest before returning home. When neither of them returned home, their friends realized something was wrong. Uh, Pastor Kakule Kawa of the CBCA Ecclesiastical Post in Bunia originally reported the missing persons. Upon investigation, the authorities said that during our search in, of, in the area after the ADF incursion, we found the service card of Pastor Paluku and his Bible on the road uh, from the farm. The ADF left with them. Uh, the couple's whereabouts remain unknown, uh, but since their church and family have neither received requests for ransom nor found their bodies, they pray and they hope uh, that there is still a chance of the couple being alive. Uh, Pastor Paluku and his wife Esther have nine children. Uh, this is from uh, Pastor Kakuli. He said, Our request is that all Christians in the world would hold hands while praying together with us. May peace return to our communities where we do the Lord's work. So let us pray that this servant of God will be free and may we be rejoicing when we see him being with us. Let us pray now for them and for our other brothers and sisters in Christ around the world who are facing similar situations. Heavenly Father, uh, we come before your throne of grace, lifting up our brothers and sisters in Christ who are held captive. Uh, you are the God of freedom, the God of justice, the God of mercy, and we trust in your power to deliver and to sustain them. Uh, we pray for your protection over these captives, that you would surround them with your angels and shield them from harm. Give them strength and courage in the face of fear and uncertainty. May your presence be a constant source of comfort and hope for them and soften the hearts of their captives that they may turn away from violence and oppression and turn to you. We also pray for the families and loved ones of these captives. Comfort them in their distress and fill them with your peace that surpasses all understanding. Lord, we remember the example of Christ who endured suffering and captivity for our sake. May these captives find solace in his sacrifice and resurrection, knowing that he is with them in their trials. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to turn your Bibles to John chapter 5. John chapter 5, we're going to be looking at uh, verses 30 to 47 for our time together this morning. 
Uh, Follow along as I read our text for us. Jesus said, I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. You sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard, his form you have never seen, and you do not have his word abide abiding in you, for you do not believe the one whom he has sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Do not think that I will accuse you. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? May God bless uh, the reading of his holy and inerrant word. For much of his early life, C.S. Lewis was an atheist, deeply skeptical skeptical about religion and the existence of God. However, through the testimonies of those around him, Lewis began a journey to faith. Uh, one of the most significant influences on Lewis was his friendship with J.R.R. Tolkien, the author of The Lord of the Rings. Tolkien was a devout Christian who engaged Lewis in deep conversations about faith, reason, and the truth of Christianity. He presented compelling arguments and personal testimonies that challenged Lewis's atheism. Lewis was also moved by the writings of other Christian authors like G.K. Chesterton, whose logical and literary defenses of the Christian faith made a profound impact on him. Over time, these testimonies from trusted friends and respected thinkers began to chip away at Lewis's skepticism. He described his conversion as being surprised by joy, realizing that the Christian story was not just a myth, but a reality rooted in historical truth and personal experience. We are deeply impacted by the testimonies of those around us. Uh, Yesterday, (laughs) Helena and I attended the uh, funeral for my school principal who taught me from kindergarten to grade 12. Uh, She had a love for teaching, she had a love for her students, and she had a love for God that radiated to all those around her, and, and that theme was echoed throughout the funeral service. It was absolutely beautiful. The importance that she placed on devotions and scripture memory and prayer and evangelism were formative in my life. And uh, I don't think I realized until fairly recently. But we are 
impacted by testimonies like this. I was impacted by her testimony. C.S. Lewis was impacted by the intellectual and personal testimonies of those who pointed him to the truth of Jesus Christ. Uh, We are impacted by the testimonies of Christians who are willing to undergo wrongful imprisonment, persecution, and even death for the sake of following Christ. Well, our, our passage of scripture this morning has the feel of a courtroom where Jesus is going to call forward a a series of witnesses to the stand whose testimonies will verify the audacious claims he made in the previous passage about him being equal with God. And just as C.S. Lewis moved from skepticism to faith through the power of testimony, we too are, are being invited in this passage to consider the evidence before us and to equally embrace the truth of who Jesus is. Look at verse 31. Uh, Jesus says, If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. Uh, the, the Old Testament law was clear that you were only to accept witness based on uh, two or three testimonies. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15 says, A single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses shall a charge be established. And, and, and this makes good common sense today as well. You know, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 17 says, the one who states his case first seems right. That is, until the other comes and examines him. (laughs) There are always two sides to every story. Therefore, every claim should be examined on the basis of two or three witnesses. That's what Jesus is saying here. Jesus isn't saying that his testimony isn't true. No, his testimony is true. But it's not sufficient on on its own. His testimony is not valid if it's not corroborated by two or three witnesses. Now, Jesus isn't saying this for his sake, as though Jesus needs to prove himself to us, that that he is indeed God. No, God does not need to prove himself to us. That's like the, the clay jar demanding the sculptor to prove that he exists. No, it's it's... It's for our sake that Jesus says his testimony is not sufficient. God has established witnesses to assist our inability to believe that which we cannot see. It's it's our hardness of heart that is the reason why there are others who bear witness about Jesus. And so let us look now at uh, at these four witnesses that Jesus puts forward for us. Uh, the first witness that Jesus calls to the stand is that of John the Baptist. In verse 33, Jesus says that John the Baptist has borne witness to the truth. And, and back in John chapter 1, verses 6 to 8, we, we saw this, right? The apostle John writes, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. That's John the Baptist. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light, and that he did. And we see that throughout uh, throughout John chapter 1 there, where uh, John the Baptist was an important human witness because the, the masses believed that he was someone special, that he was a prophet sent from God, and so they, they listened to him. They paid attention to what he said. Now, that being said, in verse 34, Jesus says, uh, not that the testimony that I receive is from man. In other words, Jesus didn't need a a human testimony like that of John the Baptist to validate him. So then why does Jesus appeal to the the testimony of John the Baptist? Why appeal to, to such a human testimony? We'll look at the end of verse 34. Jesus does so. He says, I say these things so that you may be saved. 
Jesus understood that he didn't need a merely human witness, but because of John the Baptist's influence, maybe, just maybe, the Jews would look through John to Jesus and be saved. And indeed, Jesus says in verse 35 that John the Baptist was a burning and shining lamp in whose light they were willing to rejoice in for a while. John the Baptist's witness was was unmistakable. He shined bright while he was alive. But sadly, the Jews had missed the object of John's witness, and that was Jesus. Jesus then appeals to his second witness, and that is his divine works. Look at verse 36. But the testimony that I have, Jesus says, is greater than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. And, and Nicodemus, back in, in, uh, in John chapter 3, uh, it indicated this. He said uh, in, in John chapter 3, verse 2, no one can do the things that you do unless God is with him. So, so Nicodemus saw Jesus' divine works and, and knew that, that there was something more to this, to this Jesus. Even though he was maybe not entirely convinced, he, he couldn't deny what Jesus was doing. Jesus' works confirmed who he was. The story is told of the renowned artist Paul Gustav Dorr, who lost his passport while traveling through Europe. When he came to a border crossing, he explained his predicament to one of the guards. Giving his name to the official, Dorr hoped he would be recognized and would be allowed to to pass through. The guard, however, said that many people attempted to cross the border by claiming that they were persons who they were not. Dor insisted that he was the man he claimed to be. Imagine trying to, to prove yourself to, to someone else. All right, said the official, we'll give you a test, and if you pass, we'll let you through. So he handed him a pencil and a sheet of paper, and he told the artist to sketch several peasants who were standing nearby. Well, Dora did it so quickly and skillfully that the guard was, was easily convinced that he was who he claimed to be. Uh, Dora's work confirmed his word. And in the same way, Jesus' works confirm his word. You know, thus far in John's gospel, we've seen Jesus turn water into wine. He's healed the official's son. Uh, he's healed uh, a lame man on the Sabbath. And, and the apostle John isn't done. He's going to tell us more, more miracles of Jesus. Jesus feeding the 5,000 and, and walking on water and healing a man who was born blind and, and even raising Lazarus from the dead. What is the apostle John's purpose in describing these, these works of Jesus? Well, we get our answer to that it, near the end of, of John's gospel in John chapter 20, verses 30 to 31, where John says that there are other signs that Jesus did which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John wants us to see that such divine works reveal that Jesus was truly divine. Jesus' works confirmed his word. But as we have seen, Jesus' works have have not elicited praise and worship so much as persecution and even the threat of death. Verse 18, right? This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he, he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but he was also calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. And so even his, his divine works weren't enough of a witness to persuade them. The third witness that Jesus calls to the stand is, is God the Father. Surely they will listen to the Father's witness. Look at verse 37. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me, you know, his, his voice you have never heard, though, Jesus says, and his form you have never seen. 
Um, un- unlike the other gospel accounts, which record a, a voice from heaven, uh, Jesus' baptism and transfiguration, there, there is no such voice recorded for us in John's gospel. But Jesus is getting at a deeper issue here. And that is that they don't have eyes to see and ears to hear. They, they have failed to recognize that uh, to see Jesus is to see the Father, and to hear Jesus is to hear the Father. It, it's, it's really a fulfillment of Isaiah 6, verses 9 to 10, where the prophet says, Go and say to this people, Go, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. It's, it's a story state. Their spiritual eyes, their, their spiritual ears, and their spiritual hearts were closed to the reality of who, who Jesus is. If they were truly listening, if they were, if they were truly seeing, then they would have believed the one whom the Father has sent. But as such, they, they will not accept the witness of the Father, and thus they will not accept the witness of Jesus. As a result of their rejection of the Father's witness, Jesus says in, in, in verse 38, you do not have his word abiding in you. The, the Jews, they, they thought they were people of the word, just like the, the psalmist who said, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you, Psalm 119, verse 11. But, but Jesus says that, that if they will not accept his word, then, then they do not have the word dwelling in them. And this, this leads to the fourth witness that Jesus calls to the stand, and that is Scripture. The scripture. Look at verses 39 to 40. Jesus says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Jesus rebukes his listeners for not recognizing him as the subject matter of their own scriptures. We, we see a, a glimpse of this in, in Luke chapter 24, verses 25 to 27, where Jesus says to the, the two strangers on the road to Emmaus, uh, on the road to Emmaus, shortly after his resurrection, uh, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And then it says that, uh, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to, to, to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. What a Bible study that would have been. Yeah, we, we like the Bible, right? We, we do Bible studies. We follow Bible reading plans. We, we believe that the Bible is the word of God. We, we are Bible people, are we not? But then so were the Jews. They, they knew their Bibles front to back. They had the Torah memorized by the age of 10. They, they were students of the Bible. When, when Jesus says that they search the scriptures, the Greek word Jesus uses there means to examine, to investigate. They, they knew where to look. Just not for what or whom to look. Right? They, they were experts in, in languages and, and history and culture and, and archaeology, but there was no life. They had studied the scriptures, but they had failed to discern the true purpose of the scriptures was to point the way to Jesus. Several years ago, Helena and I went up the CN Tower in Toronto. Now, I'm not one for heights. But it was amazing to see the city from that perspective. I, don't, I can't remember how many feet up it is. It's, it's thousands of feet up. Uh, and you can overlook the, the, uh, 
the city skyline and the surrounding city uh, from the comfort of this protective glass so that you're not going to think that you're going to fall out. Well, in the same way, the Bible is like a window through which we see the beauty of Christ. Now, there are two mistakes that we can make when it comes to the window of Scripture. Uh, Suppose you have a lifetime membership to the CN Tower, and you go up the CN Tower every day, but you never once look out the window. Right, you are content just to have access to the window if you should ever need it. You may have e- even multiple uh, access to, to multiple windows through which you can look out over the city, but you never once look through the window. And that's, that's the first mistake. The first mistake that we can make is that we can never open the scriptures. <coughs> is that we never open the scriptures. We, we may have a Bible in our homes. Uh, we may even have multiple versions of the Bible. We may have the Bible app on our smartphones, which gives us access to, to every version of the Bible imaginable, but not once do we open our Bibles. We are content to leave it on the shelf if we should ever need it. But such is a very big mistake. The the second mistake we can make when it comes to the the window of Scripture is this. Uh, Suppose you you go up the the CN Tower, and again, rather than looking out at the the beautiful uh, city skyline and the the surrounding scenery, you start inspecting the window, noting all of its marvelous features. You maybe even take out a pocket knife and scrape a little bit of the window in order to do a chemical analysis Right, you, you know everything about the window. You know what the window is made of. You know what the frame is made of. But again, you never once look through the window. And, and, and thus the second mistake is that we can get caught up in, in the minutia of Scripture. It, it, is, it is possible to know all the Bible stories and, and to know where every verse in the Bible is found and, and to know a lot of theology and to completely miss Jesus, because we are more focused on examining the window than looking through the window to Christ. In both scenarios, we have missed the point of the window. We have missed the point of Scripture. What then is the proper approach? It is to immerse ourselves in the Scriptures. Uh, We should look through the window of Scripture to Christ as often as we possibly can. Pastor and Bible teacher Harry Ironside did just that. Uh, By the age of 14, Harry had read through the Bible 14 times, once for every year of his life. And then during the rest of his life, he read through the Bible at least once each year. Uh, While at a a Bible conference, Harry was asked what he had read for his morning devotions. Uh, He hesitated and and humbly said, this morning I read through the book of Isaiah. I don't know if you, I don't know when the last time was that you read through the book of Isaiah. It's long, it's lengthy. And he read that for his morning devotions. Harry was was so saturated with the word of God that it, it radiated right out of him. And in the same way, we need to be people of the Bible. We need to look through the window of Scripture to Christ. To to read the Bible any other way is to miss the point of Scripture, which is what the Jews had done. Uh, So Jesus has put forward four witnesses. John the Baptist, uh, Jesus' divine works, the witness of the Father, and the witness of Scripture. But the Jews refused to listen to them. Their rejection of Jesus and his witnesses leads to this fourfold negative assessment of the Jews from Jesus in the the remaining verses. The first negative assessment from Jesus is that the love of God is not in them. 
The love of God is not in them. In verse 42, Jesus says, I, I know that you do not have the love of God within you. Now that sounds pretty harsh, right? If you don't believe in Jesus and you don't have the love of God in you, but, but that's what Jesus is saying. If you do not, if you do not love Jesus, then you do not love the Father who sent Jesus because Jesus is God in the flesh. Jesus is the invisible God made visible. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says that Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. If, if we don't love Jesus whom God has sent, then, then we don't know God. And if we don't know God, then we don't have the love of God in our hearts. Do you, do you see the, the, the dreadful connection here? Now, by the way, by, by nature, this, this is all of us. We, we do not naturally possess a love for God. Uh, on the contrary, we love everything but God. <laughs> John chapter 3, verse 19 says, And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. But I, I, I think the thing we love most is ourselves. The thing we love most is ourselves. I, I think that's what's, what's most subversive about what Jesus says about the most important commandment. It's, it's throughout the Gospels, Jesus says, uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And he says uh, a second is, is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Right? Jesus isn't commanding us to, to love ourselves because we, we're naturally good at, at loving ourselves if, if we're being honest. No, Jesus is commanding us to love our neighbors just as we love ourselves. There, there is no natural love of God in us because we are naturally full of love for ourselves. But here's the good news. While we loved ourselves, God loved us. Romans 5 verse 8 says that God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Do, do you see the irony? While we would sacrifice everything else for ourselves, God sacrificed himself for everyone else. <laughs> and, and this is why the, the act of conversion is so Powerful because it is a turning away from the world. It's a turning away from the devil. It's a turning away from us, from ourselves to God. Right? We, we don't want to be a people who are content with sin in our lives. No, we want a people, we, we want to be a people who are being transformed into the same image from, from one degree of glory to another, as, as 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 says. So may God give us a love for him that would radiate to all those around us. They did not have, the, the, the love of God was not in them. That's the, that's, that's the first negative assessment from Jesus. The second negative assessment from Jesus is that uh, they will readily follow false messiahs. They will readily follow false messiahs. Messiah. In verse 43, Jesus says, uh, I have come in my Father's name and you do not receive me. Right? We, we saw this in, in John chapter 1, verses 10 to 11. Where the Apostle John says, He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. Right? So we, we've already seen that uh, Jesus has come in the Father's name and, and they did not receive him. But then Jesus continues, if another comes in his own name, oh, you'll receive him. <laughs> yeah, see, the, the Jews, they, they were looking for the Messiah. They were looking for the Christ. And, and there were a number of people who had come and who had gained a following, but then it would fizzle out. In, in Acts chapter 5, verses 36 to 37, Gamaliel alludes to this. He says, uh, for before these days, Thutis rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. Well, he was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed, and it came to nothing. 
After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. And so there were a number of these individuals who they rose up, they said they were the Messiah, they said they were the Christ, and it fizzled out and went to nothing. And so Gamaliel's, Gamaliel's point in the book of Acts is, wait, see if this will come to nothing, and if it doesn't, if it you know rises to, to something, you don't want to be opposed to it or else you'll be opposing God. But we have a, a natural tendency to follow after false messiahs. See, our, our problem is, is not that we will believe in nothing. Our problem is that we will believe in every, anything and everything. If, if you don't believe in the one true God, someone or something will be your God. Uh, John Calvin said, the heart is a perpetual idol factory. It's just, it, your heart is constantly pumping out idols. Right? We, we are good at finding God substitutes, whether that is work, or medicine, or exercise, or food, or wealth, or family, or sports, or social justice, or the environment, Right? These are all substitute gods that we look for uh, to save us. These, these are all false messiahs that, that will make bold claims to satisfy the desires of our heart, but, but that come up woefully short on what they deliver because they're not, they're not the true messiah. The true messiah is Jesus Christ. And, and if we won't receive him, we will receive anything and everything. That's the second negative assessment. The third negative assessment from Jesus is that uh, they are glory thieves. They are glory thieves. In verse 44, Jesus says, How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Right? Here, Jesus is pointing out uh, something innate in us, and that is that we are glory-oriented creatures. We, we are attracted to glorious things. It's how God has wired us. God created a glorious world to point us to his glory. Whenever we see glorious things, we are reminded to give God the glory. Or at least that was, that was God's intention in creation. But sin has turned us into glory thieves, where we attempt to steal God's glory for ourselves. We, we see this in Romans chapter 1, verses 22 to 23, where the Apostle Paul says, claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. Right? We've exchanged the glory of God for lesser and created things. Well, the problem is, is that we crave glory that doesn't belong to us. Paul Tripp writes, at the bottom of a broken marriage, a shattered family, or a for forsaken friendship, you will always find stolen glory. And this puts, at a, at, at, puts us at odds with the king of glory. In verse 41, Jesus says, I do not receive glory from people. Why? Because Jesus knows what is in the heart of man. We saw that at the end of, of, uh, of John chapter 2. He, he knows that we do not naturally love God, that we do not naturally, <laughs> that we do not naturally uh, seek the glory that comes from the only God. Because we love man's approval more than we love God's approval. And this leads to the, the final negative assessment from Jesus. And goodness, if, we, if our hearts have not been exposed up until this point, the final negative assessment from Jesus is that Moses accuses them. Moses accuses them. In verse 45, Jesus says, I do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, and that's Moses, on whom you have set your hope. Uh, last week, we, we saw that uh, Jesus is the judge. He's been given the authority to exercise judgment. Here we read, Moses is the accuser. 
which we don't typically think of uh, Moses being the accuser. We think of the devil being the accuser. But the, the Jews were all about Moses. They were all about the Torah. Uh, but what Jesus is doing here is he's challenging the object of their faith. You know, what have you put your faith in? And what, what they had done is they had put their trust in themselves. They had put their trust in uh, their religious tradition. They had put their trust in their forefathers rather than putting their trust in the Lord, rather than putting their trust in Jesus, whom the Father had sent. And Jesus says in verse 46, For if you believed Moses, you would believe me for he wrote of me. Now Jesus is saying, if you really knew Moses, you really knew your Bible, then you would know me. But when Moses talks about the the serpent crusher in in Genesis chapter 3, and the lion of the tribe of Judah in Genesis chapter 49, and the Passover lamb in Exodus 12, and the goat for the sin offering in Leviticus chapter 16, and the true and better prophet in Deuteronomy 18, Jesus is saying, Moses is writing about me. It's about me. And that's not Jesus being egocentric. It really is. It's all about him. He is the word made flesh. So why would we think anything else? But Jesus says in verse 47, if you do not believe his writings, right? So if you if you have venerated Moses and the Torah and, and, and Scripture, if you will not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? How will you believe my words? What an indictment. Sin had so blinded them that they would not and could not believe in Jesus. Jesus. And such is the devastating reality for all, for all those who, who do not believe in the Lord Jesus. Uh, apart from the grace and mercy of God in changing our hearts, in changing our affections, in changing our wills, we would all be headed for a lost eternity. We would all be in the same sorry state. What is required of us? We must lay hold of Christ, whose witness is more than sufficient. It's more than sufficient. Uh, Lee Strobel, uh, an award-winning uh, journalist and formal legal editor of the Chicago Tribune, uh, was once a staunch atheist. Uh, his life changed dramatically, however, when his wife Leslie became a Christian. Uh, Strobel feared that her newfound faith would ruin their marriage, and so he was determined to disprove Christianity and bring his wife back to atheism. Strobel embarked on a journey to investigate the claims of Jesus Christ. So using his uh, journalistic and legal skills, Strobel examined the evidence for Jesus' resurrection, the historical reliability of the New Testament, and the claims about Jesus' identity. Uh, He interviewed uh, numerous experts in theology, history, and biblical scholarship rigorously, analyzing their testimonies and the evidence that they were presenting. And it was through this exhaustive investigation that Strobel found that the historical evidence for Jesus' resurrection was robust, that the New Testament documents were reliable, and that the claims of Jesus' divinity were credible and formational and transformative. Strobel's journey from skepticism to faith culminated in his conversion to Christianity. He realized that the evidence overwhelmingly supported the claims of Jesus Christ, and he could no longer deny the truth. This morning, we have been confronted by the most powerful testimonies from the most reliable witnesses to Jesus. And the question for us is, will we embrace these 
testimonies about Jesus and declare that Jesus is, in fact, who he claimed to be? Or we will we, with sin-blinded eyes and sin-deafened ears and sin-hardened hearts refuse to accept their testimony and reject our only hope in life and death. The choice is ours. But oh, God help us. May we choose wisely. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the profound truth of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the many witnesses that testify to his divine authority. Help us to hear his voice speaking to us in the scriptures. Help us to trust in his divine authority. And help us to become all the more convinced of the salvation found in Jesus Christ alone. May we live lives that reflect our faith in Jesus and give us the courage to stand firm in our faith even when we face trials of various kinds. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.